So good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name's Chloe Mustafa. I'm the marketing manager here at Cobweb. And today is a very big day for us. We're going to have a lot of security webinars today, and this is the very first one that we're kicking off with. So we're joined by Francis Gaffney, who is Director of Threat, Threat Intelligence at Mimecast. Thank you for joining us today, Francis. No worries. And so he's going to be taking us through, obviously, the current security, cybersecurity landscape, especially in relation to what's going on in the world at the moment. But he actually has a really interesting sort of background himself. So, Francis, if you just want to tell us a little bit about yourself. OK, so as uh, Chloe just said, so I'm Francis Gaffney. Um, I joined Mimecast uh, about a year ago, so I came from government. Um, I worked for uh, several of the various agencies. Um, I've been doing this sort of thing, risk analysis and intelligence, for about 20 years, and then cyber was for about the last um, six or so. Um, we have uh, not a strange past, but um, I started off in counterterrorism, and uh, one of the government understandings was that the methodology and processes that we use to assess how a terrorist would conduct um, activity, malicious activity or terrorist activity, was actually very similar to what we were observing in the cyber landscape. So a lot of us were invited to go across to cyber to see if we could apply those same analytical tools, which I'll come into in a moment. So yes, I came out to various companies to give briefs on what we did and how we actually conducted cyber operations and Mimecast uh, then said to me, you know, how about you come and join us? So yes, I did. So just to give you a, a nice little um, sort of thing, this is not going to be a sales pitch. So part of my background, as I said, was uh, government work. We do not sell intelligence. We do not try to influence you with intelligence. What we try to do is present you with the facts and the assessment that we have made based on these analytical tools I'll talk about later. And then it's up for you as the key decision maker to make the decision as to whether whether you not say you choose to believe our assessment, whether you accept our assessment. And this is all back to, if you remember, the Chilcot inquiry uh, for Iraq. And that's where assessments were changed, not to jazz it up, which is you know, what was implied. It was just actually to strengthen the assessment to, you know, and that's where it was told that, you know, intelligence should be totally um, objective of the actual aims of someone else. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is really just how geopolitical events affect what happens in your inbox. and. We have a lot of people talk about, oh, I've stopped this cyber, I've stopped this cyber threat. But what we do at Mimecast is look wider. And I look at geopolitical events. So, you know, a, a new data center opened up in Poland, you would have seen in the news today. Um, you know, the investment in South America. These sort of things will have an impact somehow in the cyber domain uh, because it is now just such a, a widespread um, globalized market, for one of a better way of describing it. So. We look at not just the cyber threats, we actually look at also geopolitical events. So as I just mentioned, intelligence fails when I use it to influence. So when we make intelligence uh, assessments and products, we have to make it contextual. So if I make a very, very vanilla, as we would say, intelligence assessment, it's actually no good to anybody. Um, I've got a webinar with uh, Australia tomorrow morning, first thing, and therefore the intelligence uh, assessment I'm going to be making has to be contextualised to Australia. I have to look at the threats that are unique to Australia. There's no more point me talking about the UK threats because that doesn't have any sort of grounds in Australia. It has to be actionable. Now, this is one of my huge pet hates with people who call themselves intelligence analysts. Uh, and I'm sure those who are my casters are sitting listening has heard me say this thousands of times. But really, intelligence has to be predictive. And when I see that written down, we do predictive intelligence. That to me is like an oxymoron. Predictive intelligence. Intelligence is, by its very nature, has to be predictive. So when I look at a weather report, the first part of the weather report tells me what the weather was like in London. Well, that's brilliant. I have a window. I saw what the weather was like. But... That's what people say. We saw this. We saw you had an indicator of compromise. There's the intelligence. Well, actually, that's the news. What I want to know is, do I need an umbrella for tomorrow? That's the actionable bit. What's the so what? Um, and again, I see lots of people's reports. They'll say, yes, um, I can predict the sun will come up tomorrow. Well, yes, based on experience, uh, experiences and so on, you can. But actually, where the intelligence, where you use analytical tools, I can actually tell you what angle the sun is going to be at when it rises and actually what time. So there's those slight differences. 
it also has the easily consumable. I can use lots of big words and lots of technical stuff to do with um, cyber, but obviously if the person can't read it, then it's absolutely a waste of time. And that's where that instructive comes in, instructive comes in, that I should actually be writing for my audience, not writing for myself. So that's where we stand in terms of intelligence in Mimecast. So um, we use a sort of analogy in um, Mimecast itself of this um, yeah, email security 3.0, they're calling it. And this is where um, I am in the castle keep. I'm in the middle of this castle and I have my firewall around me protecting me. But I actually also need to start thinking about what they're doing in the outside world. And that's where I talked about these geopolitical events, but also what the threat actors are up to. So we do sit in various you know, groups in various places, chat groups and things, so that we can see what they're doing. So this is us looking beyond the perimeter. We call this active defense, where I'm going up threat to see what's going on. And that's you know, using the castle keep analogy, where they're building a new trebuchet in the forest. Well, they're building a new trebuchet in the forest. At least I can actually strengthen my walls or you know, think about a different method of defense based on that uh, new findings. But actually also the castle keep is the, uh, another part of this. So I've got my firewall, I'm looking up threat, but actually inside the castle keep itself, have I got vulnerable people inside? And I'm not saying that they're malicious or that they're unfaithful servants, but you'll see I'm gonna sort of not belabor this point, but human error, unfortunately, uh, affects over 90% of what we see. And uh, you know this is repeated in so many different companies, research, um, uh, reports that you know it's human error and that's what I'm going to talk to you about in particular so I said that um, it, we talk about these geopolitical events and threat actors use these times um, to exploit confusion so everyone's thinking at the moment this very moment about you know whether the uh, risk of infection for COVID is going to go up uh, they're worried about whether we're going to start returning to work we're also worried about campaigns and this is the time where they'll exploit that confusion because people will be clicking on links to see you know get updated news or it could be that I'm impersonating somebody you know that says you know uh, uh, looks like we're going back to work you click on the link have to log in to see that email and you know I've got you so a nice example when we were talking about this originally before the COVID happened was the bushfires in um, Australia. And we saw so, so, so many emails start picking up there. Um, uh, you know, people were offering health advice, whether you get funding from government to help with ventilation in your house, uh, you know, filters, uh, whether there's you know, money available for insurance and so on and so forth. And again, that was just where threat actors were exploiting a, a good, in their eyes, opportunity. And you see the bottom of the screen there, they were also looking for donations. And obviously it wasn't going to go to the Salvation Army or the Disaster Appeals. It was obviously going to go to um, those uh, malicious actors. Then unfortunately we came into coronavirus, you can see there the end of January, um, we started seeing quite a few in our landscape, our customers were starting to report them through. And this was where people were just not sure of the safety measures, what was going on, and it was just very scary for a lot of people. So they were clicking on these links and obviously the malware was being able to be downloaded or spyware and so on and so forth. So working from home, well, we offer these practices like update your home Wi-Fi and storage password. And in previous talks I've given, I've shown how data in transit can be conducted. And there's this great little thing, if you're a baddie, called a pineapple. And what can happen is I can sit outside your home and I can actually give a stronger Wi-Fi signal than your home one. And you'll connect to me rather than your home one. Um, it's used a lot around airports or people's phones, you know, uh, cafes where I'm actually using my phone. Um, it goes to the strongest, you know, 4G, 5G signal, which would be the pineapple. So this data in transit is making sure that you have your home Wi-Fi and, and had good, strong passwords. Make sure your contact information is up to date. And one of the very unfortunate things that's going on at the moment is, as you see in the news, a lot of companies are going under. And that to me as a threat actor, and I'm gonna try and talk about as a, in the sort of lens of a threat actor from now on, I'm looking for those opportunities. I'm looking for those companies that have gone bust, you know, that the person who used to mow your lawn, I can actually email and say, look, you know, I've had to change my bank details because of what's gone on. Please pay the money into this account instead. It could be that, uh, you know, I'm now talking to you on behalf of one of your suppliers that doesn't exist anymore. So that, those impersonation attacks. So it's just making sure that you, your, your particular information is up to date so that you know, it can be verified. Don't click on COVID-19 related links. You know, um, if you can go straight to the you know, .gov website and enter the address in, that would be the better way. Um, 
try and hover over the address to see if it is actually going to the address that you think it's going to. Um, a lot of people using mobile devices, myself included, you can't actually do that as easily. So therefore, it is that important thing of you know, double check checking the URLs and links if the suspicious don't click on. And obviously update your username and passwords on trusted sites only or when you're in a trusted environment, i.e. your home Wi-Fi that is protected. So what have we seen? Well, you know, since it started, the number of campaigns increased. They have actually tailed off, not meaning that there's no attacks now. It's just actually gone back to the norm when we first saw it. So around about uh, the figures there you see at the beginning, but around about between 10 and 15% of emails we see are COVID related. So it's not just the word COVID, it has all the different things like Kung flu, China flu, all the various monikers uh, are used for this. So it started, you know, fairly low, got to 15. It did increase, as you see from the graphs there, 20, 25% of what we were seeing. Now you're thinking, gosh, that's uh, you know, not many, but the spam rejections alone was 3 million. We see well over you know, a billion emails a week. So it is quite a big percentage of what we're seeing in terms of um, these, uh, not just spam, but also COVID related campaigns. So me, I'm trying to, as a threat actor, I'm trying to get you to click on links. I'm trying to lure you into clicking on links. And you can see here, weaponizing these pandemic keywords and what they're doing, the threat actors is using these people's vulnerabilities. And people are worried. People want to know whether they were at the time going to get furloughed, whether they can access grants, whether there's any funds available. And, you know, if I had these links in, people then clicking on them. You can see the huge increase right the way through in the end to March there of the number of blocks pages we were blocking a day in terms of websites and things. So we block a, a number of URLs that we get from various uh, colleagues in the industry, from government uh, advice. Um, and our own research. And so we are blocking more and more and more every day because people are obviously creating these uh, malicious sites. We've also seen, unfortunately, increase in web spoofing. So where that data and transit attack I was just talking about. So where I log on to what I'm thinking is going to Tesco's, it's actually test dot co uh, if i actually zoomed in or one we're seeing where you get the accents you know the graph and the cute accents above an e that you know the, the font is so small people can't see the, these are ones where you think you're going to a legitimate site and unfortunately it's uh, going to one of their sites and you can see there's sixty thousand registered domains that were covid related in those early days some of them legitimate but unfortunately many not and so the examples we were given uh, just from what we'd seen in our own data sets was the ones from uh, Costco and Walmart, particularly. Um, there was quite a number of those that, uh, say, the threat actors had tried using. So what are we worried about? Well, I've talked about the COVID campaigns and really what we're seeing in terms of the malware. So whether it be ransomware, whether it be uh, you inviting you or luring you to click on links. The, the actual methodologies of the threat actors has been the same. They're just using different lures. So when people do click on a link, it's still going into that traditional methodology, that, that traditional malware that they've used. But it's just the lure that's changed. And the potential um, for returning to work is going to create these new opportunities, these new lures, because Again, there's going to be confusion. There's going to be some parts of the enterprise that we're going back to work, others not. There'll be parts of your supply chain going back to work where you may not. They'll be asking for people to go back into companies. So there's quite a big potential here for, again, exploitation by threat actors. And one of the methods we use to look at the environment is a stemple. Some of you may have seen this in uh, you know, uh, BCP, the um, you know, Business Continuity Plan training and various other trainings you may have done. Um, we use stemples because it's the easiest, but stemples. So, so I'll look at the sociological impact. So we as a society have been changed by coronavirus. Many people may not actually ever go back to their workplace because this remote working saves money on uh, you know, real estate for companies. It could be that uh, people prefer this method of working now because it gives them a better home life balance. So the sociological impact. And we've gone through a number of scenarios there that we, we investigated. We also looked at the technological and the technological here um, would be well, what new te te uh, technological advances or what um, practices people have. And again, in this case, we were on um, Teams here, but you've seen the you know, rise of Zoom, various communication apps. Those of you who have children, you can see Google Classroom and various others. And this is what people have needed to develop to or use to be able to continue working. So the technological landscape 
has been changed and you know companies may think actually this is a, a new way a better way of working economically we are changed now and um, those who are not in the uk who are overseas but the uk we were quite protected in a very very strange way it's one of these unintended consequences because um the uk were warehousing for the impact of brexit on the 31st of january that people may panic by people didn't know so actually do you know when this all started for us in february when people did start going in the shops were able to replenish quite quickly because the supply chains were in place um yeah having planned for a, a totally different scenario so we were cushioned a bit in terms of retail but look how many companies are affected look how many uh, people are self-employed are being affected so the economic landscape is not quite grim but it's not a, not a great place for us military you think well wait a minute <laughs> why are we talking about military we're a corporation well this is where military contracts as many many cyber companies rely on military contracts and there are quite a few who do research uh, they may not realize necessarily they're doing research for uh, the military directly because not because the military have kept it secret it's just because the the company that was awarded the contract has actually set it out to second and third order or second and third layer um, subcontractors. So again, contracts here, this is where the military do prop up uh, some companies in an unforeseen way. The political landscape has definitely changed. You know, again, the discussions uh, of whether we phase return, how we're going to return, how long this return is going to take. Um, and we're all able to sit and talk about this to so the cows come home, really, until uh, for, in the UK, the prime minister makes his decision. We look to other countries to see what they're doing. But that's not necessarily reliable because those you are tracking the science of it and we have one of the government virologists going to come and give us a talk on one of our thought leadership thursdays and he's talking about the actual vaccine could actually may not uh, ever um, be made because it's uh, you know a particularly a tricky type to um, vaccinate against so it could be that we're looking for a treatment and then that's when at least if people return to work they can be treated if they do get it but the political also is i need to start doing these returns so conversation about having primary schools going back first and that's because that can free up the parents then go back to their workplaces whereas you know secondary school age children um, if they're at home that's not going to be such a problem for childcare. Um, I also need to make sure the teaching staff are back because they've got their own children so the, the, those complications there. We also have to look at the uh, economic part of the the environment for children because some of them are not getting those free school meals so some children are going hungry um me i also sit as a magistrate and i've seen a, a, any number of domestic violence increasing so there are these different political um, ramifications for not returning but at the same time we have to watch the um, infection rate because if it, it starts climbing again as it has in spain germany and um, italy well, then the lockdown measures will have to go back in and be more stringent. So do we lift early and then have to you know, be more harsh later? Or do we just wait a couple more weeks, three or four more weeks before we start our phase return? Israel, for example, all the schools, everything goes back pretty much not as normal, but pretty much on Sunday. And again, we will just see um, what impact that will have. The virus, as I was just mentioned about the virologist, you know, there's so many complications with it in terms of you know, why we can't compare like for like in different countries. It's how they report statistics, whether they care, um, care homes, whether we count related deaths. So say if, if you look at the death certificate, it's the person died of pneumonia, but it could have been COVID related. Therefore, it counts as a COVID death. It may not have. The patient may have died of pneumonia, but there was, uh, you know, the potential that COVID had a part to play in it. Um, we're seeing that you know, blood group A are more susceptible. We're seeing that it affects men more than women. We're seeing that um, it uh, can actually have some sort of genetic effect, a bit like CJD. So there are so, so many questions going on that the political uh, decision makers are having to think about whether we start this phase return early and how they're going to do it. The legal ramifications. So those you saw yesterday in the news, the tracking app uh, that we use in the UK. Um, it's not as uh, robust as one would think, and there's a surprise for you know, such things. But also, um, as uh, the NHSX uh, director was being interviewed by um, the MPs uh, for the Information Commissioner, they were saying that actually, even though the data is not actually anonymised, it's pseudonyms used instead, um, they may continue this after um, the crisis um, has ended and also may sell the data on for research uh, purposes later 
because it's been semi-anonymized. So these have legal ramifications because firstly, that's human rights violation, but also, you know, you're downloading the app in this trust thinking that actually um, I, uh, you know, I'm entitled to protect my data, but actually there's these complications with it. And the other part of tracking, if those of you who have got the app will know it's actually um, sends the messaging bits by Bluetooth. And as I just said about the pineapple, it's so easy to uh, do data in the middle attacks on these sort of devices. Environmental. Now, the environmental here is not necessarily the environment we are speaking of in terms of climate change and things. This is actually the the, the, the various physical environments around the person. So it could be that uh, we're talking about, I mean, is uh, climate there, but it could be that pollution and various other things may stop me doing X, Y, and Z. And security, you know, people need to be feel safe. So when we do do this uh, phase return, I want to jump on the train. Well, is it going to be safe to get on the train when I go on my next flights overseas? You know, how many people can actually physically get on the 747 when we're enforcing social distancing? And, you know, if we are only allowing 30 people in a 400 seat plane, well, then I'm going to have to change the prices to increase it accordingly to what about 15 times the normal price because I have to offset the other people that are not on now on the plane. So the security changes that may come in. Um, you know, are they going to be left with us? And sometimes it becomes the new norm and those sanctions are never lifted, um, as we saw with uh, various uh, terrorist legislation that came in after the September the 11th. These, that legislation was aimed to be temporary, but has ended up being semi-permanent. So on to my favourite slide. So I am now talking as a baddie. OK, so get yourself comfortable. Um, I, I'm just going to introduce you to the world of what a threat actor sees. Now, I am going to not run over the surface of the water a bit. I, I just don't want to have this recording being used as a threat actor thinking, actually, I didn't think of that. That's a pretty good way of attacking, actually. So I'm going to talk about things that we've seen in the past and various others, but I don't want to go into detail um, just because... I say I don't want to be seen as sanctioning or giving you know, ideas. So part of your your defensive uh, layered approach, you know, it wouldn't just be that you have the file, you're happy. You would actually have a number of different processes in place, people in place and various hardware, software that you use to protect yourselves. Me as the threat actor, I'm looking for vulnerabilities in there. And my biggest, biggest, biggest vulnerability, my biggest target I'm going for is the one smack in the middle of the people people are so vulnerable. So when I get to that one, I'm going to have a great play because there are so many different ways I can actually get you to click on a link. You would have seen the Darren Brown things where they get people to do things. Think people wouldn't do that. They do when it's taken out of context. If I lure you in properly and I do a good pattern of analysis, I will get you. So let's look at the hardware first. So hardware could be that when we start looking at going back to work or when we are at work, when you've been getting up at home and various things, you may not have been getting used to locking your screen. So that's a, a nice little simple one. When you're back to the office, you may not lock the screen because you've just been several weeks without locking your screen. It's just become habit. It could be that you've forgotten your PIN number for your pass. I mean, I know I'm going to have to look my one up. But when you get back into the building, you won't remember your PIN number, but you're hoping that you know someone will let you tailgate into the building. So therefore, this hard way, I'm going to get accesses to the physical um, aspects of it because I can tailgate into buildings. Another one with the buildings is that people haven't been there on the sites. Security guards themselves have been either furloughed or self-isolating because of potential infection. Police are very, very, very busy, um, obviously answering and dealing with everything that's going on anyway. That uh, We're noticing a number of break-ins to firms and firms won't notice those break-ins until they start returning to work, that people have actually been able to access their servers or various IT. Another one with the hardware is um, many companies not were caught on the hop, but, you know, with the closures and the enforcement that happened with these restrictions, they were having to send out laptops to their staff at home, even though they had desktops in the office. And so this hardware will give me that duplicate, that shadow IT. So some of it has actually been patched. Others haven't. Um, you know, the, the equipment that went out to people by courier. So when I'm returning to work, I'm going to get duplicated systems for a while. And that's a good opportunity for me as a threat actor to start and, you know, obviously exploit that confusion with this, uh, you know, duplicate systems to sort of try and drop my attack on you. <clears throat> Software then um, is... Uh, an interesting one again because patches whether the patches happened because uh, you know um, the communications themselves were interrupted um, 
whether people actually have been able to patch because, you know, getting hold of the various patches. We see so many different um, uh, advisories come out from government as we find new, you know, new vulnerabilities in various uh, softwares, um, as we saw with uh, Zoom and various other communication apps. It wasn't just Zoom. So there, there are a number of things that um, I can exploit as a threat actor because people are using new um, tools and techniques that they have been used to, and I can try and expose those vulnerabilities where I can. So on to my favorite, the people. So how do I do a pattern of, an, a, a pattern of life analysis? So if I'm after a particular person, I was just talking about to Chloe about this in the green room. What I'm doing on these Zoom calls, and I can, you know, if I try and Zoom bomb or I go to your social media, and I'll get onto social media particularly in a moment, what I'm looking for really is in the background. Now, I know people now are using virtual backgrounds, but the first thing I do is take a screenshot. I know I'm naughty, but I'll take a screenshot because I want to see what's in your house. I want to see what TV you have in the background, what printer you're using, what phone you have on the desk, because what I'm looking for is what type of uh, equipment you have. And say for me, uh, you know, I'm not on your rockstar wages, so my TV is fairly old and therefore the firmware hasn't been updated because the TV company is not going to keep updating the, the firmware. They want you to buy the latest model, whereas my one made, you know, around 1822, they're not going to update that firmware you know, infinitely. So I can actually see you've got um, tech in your background that you, um, I know the firmware hasn't been updated on, therefore it's got known vulnerabilities. And that then becomes my method of attack. I will actually try and get into your systems that way, piggyback on your home network into your office. So where people then uploading PowerPoints and various other things. And, you know, the firewalls, the company's security policies don't let you do it. So people then do workarounds. People have to work. They have to get that, that you know, Q4 report in. They have to give their sales uh, figures for that week. And I know that you're going to do that. So therefore, I'm going to play with your system at home, make it so that you actually, you know, do these workarounds, that you actually use Dropbox, that you'll use um, uh, Slack to send these bigger files. And therefore, I can get around um, your normal security um, systems. Go on to social media then. So those people say, I don't do social media. You are my absolute loveliest people. I love people that don't do social media because I'm going to impersonate you. I'm going to find out about your life and I'm going to impersonate you. And it is easy to do because if you look at people's networks, whether it be professional or social, you're not on social media. There's quite a big gap there because your, your photo may appear in those pictures of you all at the pub. And I'm thinking, well, who is that person? I can't find them in the, you know, this, this uh, pattern of life analysis I'm doing. So therefore, this person either doesn't have a social media presence or has a background that they're trying to protect. So then you become my target. Not the actual other people. They've declared themselves. I can go after them anytime I like. I'm after the people that don't declare themselves. So what I'll start doing now is looking for you. So there could be a picture of you in the pub. And then what I'll do, there's various programs. And I'll tell you one, Tinai. That's a nice, easy one. And Tinai lets me find you, you know, your image anywhere else on the web. And um, it's fairly easy to use. I can actually look at the metadata and actually can give me geolocations. So it could be that you particularly don't have um, a social media presence, but your family may do, your friends do. And therefore, I can actually find a lot uh, about you. It could be that your children appear in other people's photos. So now I'm going to try and find out where your children go to school from their school uniform. Um, I can actually look at where people have tagged you. So I think actually there's those tags that person keeps going to. They seem to go to that same restaurant all the time. And the restaurant's going to come up in a moment. So what I'm doing is actually just building up a, a view of your life. And by doing this, I can actually then start that impersonation attack because you're not on the web, uh, on the social media to see that I'm doing that. Your friends just assume that I'm actually there with you. So, and as I build up more and more of your contacts, more and more will accept me because you look for those mutual connections when you're doing this. So I will then um, be able to uh, impersonate your life. But if I'm not doing that impersonation, I'm just looking for things I can make you vulnerable for. So say you actually are already on uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram and various other um, social media apps. What I'm going to do there is what I just said, I'll be looking for where you tag yourself, where you link in. And the restaurants one is quite a nice one because, you know, if I get a letter saying I've just won the national lottery in, in Germany, having never done it in Germany, I'll be a bit suspicious of that one. However, if I send you a 10% voucher for your favorite restaurant, because I know you check in there a lot, you're likely to click on that link and accept that voucher. You'll download that voucher where I've put an executable or something behind that voucher. 
and then I'm into your system again. So what I'm looking for really in that whole social media and, and those sort of things is the ways I can get into your home life at the moment because you obviously you're remote working. In terms of your work life, actually it's still easier for me to get into for your home and piggyback into your work. So as I said about that Q4 reports, as I said about those sales reports, that's where I'm trying to piggyback onto. Contractors are a gift, and I'm going to come on to those in a moment when we talk about partners, because they will actually use open Wi-Fi because they've got a you know, contract. They've got to get this done. If they don't do it, they lose the contract. You know, they've, got, they've got to deliver. Therefore, if I can actually somehow, and there are methods I can use, to slow down your systems from working or able to connect, you'll go to whichever one lets you connect. So you'll go to that open Wi-Fi in the Starbucks or in the hotel lobby so that you can connect. And then once you're on that open system, I can then just drop down onto your system fairly easy. And those of you who are old uh, lags like me, you remember the days in the city of London where when this is all first starting, this is back in the early 90s, and we used to go around in vans with uh, Pringles tins collecting passwords as they were transiting it through the ether as people were thinking this email is a quite a cool thing. Um, driving around with pineapples in the back of the car when we get to like Biggin Hill to get a flight, everyone connects to the pineapple and then as the plane transits towards the main terminal, it picks up the stronger, you know, Wi-Fi, um, 3G, 4G link. So those data and transit attacks, um, those who use Fire Sheep, I don't know if you remember that one, that was another nice one. You'd sit in McDonald's or Starbucks and they'd connect to the free Wi-Fi that was provided by them. And you just sit there doing the man in the middle attacks. So people, I can make them vulnerable by messing around with their systems, slowing down their processes, making their batteries run out, that sort of thing. And therefore, they will actually then do the workarounds, which is I'm trying to get them off that secure network and into a different network where I can um, obviously exploit them. Moving on to processes then, um, people follow processes. We have processes in place, but this is a brilliant opportunity because no one's prepared for this. You know, a lot of the BCP plans didn't necessarily have the entire company having to remote working. A lot of people had as their backup plans going to uh, uh, serviced offices and various other things. So say there was a fire in your building, you had a backup plan to move to a new office uh, you know, and then up you go, not to remote work. So these processes are all new and you know, HR have done an amazing job in our company. They have been amazing, but yeah, various others, they're trying to work out what to do, how to support the staff. Um, those processes include well-being, mental health, because again, a lot of people are struggling. If you're like me, you're sitting on a bed. I don't have an office in my house. I don't have the space. I have two hobbits downstairs doing their Google classrooms at two different schools. So they're in two different rooms. So I've either got to go outside or go to my bedroom to do work. So processes are all changing. And me as a threat actor, I'm going to exploit them. Um, you know, whereas I could do the large file send that's protected, you know, my Wi-Fi at home is not that strong. So therefore, I'm going to do it through Slack. I can send a big message that way and it's easier to send it. So these processes I'm looking at. So while part of that part, pattern of life analysis I'm talking about is where I sit down and drop spyware. That's so instead of doing some attack on you straight away, I'm actually just going to watch what you do so that I can actually have a better chance because that's what I'm always trying to do is a better chance to do that attack. So this doesn't happen with opportunistic. You know, opportunistic would be those Wi-Fi where people aren't using good passwords, but this is where I'm actually spear fishing or spear whaling. I'm going after a big target. So I've invested a week to two weeks. I mean, a week, I usually get a good enough pattern of life analysis on a target, but two weeks, I'll be pretty much inside their life. So that spear whaling, that spear fishing, I can actually do a very, very good lure. And the usual one is, a safe one is the, the, the voucher for the restaurant because people love good 10% off. Uh, are their favorite place and obviously they trust them and then partners well as i said at the beginning unfortunately a lot of companies will have gone under so your supply chain may actually not be there you just don't know it is there and they're saying well obviously with all the changes we had to move offices we have to change banks because the bank went under whatever yeah they'll do a well crafted story and actually the the new bank details are this it could be that the um, the vulnerability of those companies has been exposed so again a good attack is always uh, by a by the flanks as it were so instead of me attacking you direct because you know you have a very good security provider i'm going to go th into your supply chain and see actually there's this chap here who connects regularly at mcdonald's because he's a built-in contractor or whatever not not judging um and therefore i can piggyback on his and then get into your system that way because you'll accept the email from him as a trusted contractor so these partners actually are also 
uh, another vulnerability, uh, but it's linked into people again because people would trust who they think is a you know a trusted partner when actually, unfortunately, they've been compromised. And again, the news unfortunately is full of these where uh, you know a, a law firm or a big uh, in this one in, in America, the big shopping uh, outlet that actually had been compromised through their HP. So there was you know, various other tax methodologies I can use in that layered approach. But you, as a you know a, a good cyber hygiene uh, aware person, the key things really here are being aware of threats. So this bit here, this you know, layered approach I just went through and the stemples before, it's just making you aware of what is going on out there. Um, and again, apologies, I've, I've taught some of you to suck eggs, but it is just to reinforce that, that awareness training is so, so important that people um, are vulnerable because they're not aware of new attacks. So whew, here's a busy slide, but really, I mean, I am going to not read it to you, but I'm going to go through the points because it, uh, it is important. But that you see there, the top of the list is that awareness training. You need to think about this. And if you are returning to work, before you go back, maybe have a Zoom call where you just go through that refresher training, you know, just to remind people about locking their screen as they get um, get up. A lot of people will be worried, you know, because even before you return to the offices, even if it's lifted, we need to have a deep clean in the office because, you know, I know I left food on my desk and it's freely running around the office now, I would suggest. And there's a cheese, I'm sure that's, you know, creating a Lord of the Flies um, scenario in on my floor. But also, you know, the air conditioner hasn't been used for a while, so we've got to clean those through. The water hasn't been run through, so they're going to have to run through for a couple of hours. So there are so many different things that we will actually have to remind our staff and our friends of before we go back. So, uh, you know, those refresher training sessions would be good. And then including that, that good cyber hygiene, make sure that you do lock your screen, make sure that your passwords are changed and those sort of things. Keep users informed of that current and prevalent threat. So part of that cyber hygiene, uh, training would be what what threats are we seeing so we're seeing a number of ransomware um, because they're again successful they're monetized but a lot of it is the malware and the um, spyware just watching what you're doing and encouraging you to click on links where I can actually harvest your credentials part of the credentials harvesting and I don't know if you know with cold callers when people are in the, the house um, and I can hear you know that, that recording about to start or that it's a, one of those you know, computer generated telephone calls I hang up straight away because part of the price of selling on is selling an active telephone number. So if people reply to these emails or click on stop or those sort of things, that tells me that's a valid email. It's still in use. It's not a ghost email. So these actually things have monetized value. So if I have a telephone number, it's worth, say, 5p. But a telephone number that's valid, that's now worth 8p. So there's different things, uh, you know, people need to be aware of that, even though they may think they're savvy by even just engaging with some of these, you're telling me it's an active account. Um, things we see with these threats would be um, people um, put it into uh, sandboxes and they think it's fairly safe to do these in sandboxes. It's not always because again, some of the threat actors are very, very sophisticated and actually have got threat, um, the sandbox evasion tools. And by you then using the target uh, malware in the sandbox actually tells the, the threat actor you've got sandbox uh, detection uh, capabilities and things I'm looking for in your sandbox I'm looking to see whether you, it's a user so if I know I've been dropped into a sandbox I know it hasn't you know stuff hasn't been sent to a printer for a while I can see the resolution of the screen well okay if the screen hasn't got any resolution that tells me it's not a human user so there's lots of things uh, I can find out about your system just by putting it in a sandbox, uh, we use browser isolation. So it, we open up in a browser that's actually technically not connected to the web. It's a very clever system. So there's different ways um, that the threat actors are developing. The voicemail uh, phishing attacks, uh, again, you may have seen these, very, very clever. So this is where, you know, it's a voicemail. You click on it to hear the voicemail, and it does actually sound like the person. Um, and again, there's ways me as a threat actor, I could have got your voice. Um, so there are things that give it away, though, would be the mannerisms, the colloquialisms. Um, anyone listens to me, you can hear the sarcastic tone when I'm talking. So obviously the, the fishing would have to include that if they were trying to Im impersonate me. Don't send out links to resources. So again, you know, this is uh, one of these counterintuitive things, because those you remembered back in the the um, early 2000s when the road to Amarillo, you know, I don't remember the, the military lads walking around the base. And it actually just crippled the defense uh, internet MOD because people were sending that to each other and it was like three megabytes, but you were sending it to someone who's already sent it and effectively transiting our system was 
you know, many, 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 many bytes of video just been sent to all their friends. So obviously people now send links, but with links comes that risk of um, giving a, a dodgy link because people are now trying to find out what's going on. They'll click on links. So this is where you have to have your policies or just have one secure page with the link always going to that, you know, a very clear one that you actually know, tell the, your, your, your customers or your um, staff to go to that one page because that's where everything is. Is it putting eggs in baskets if you have a DDoS attack? You know, so there are, again, lots of things you have to think about, but sending out links, as we've seen, is that a big vulnerability. Well, if you're doing that, you're actually playing into the hands of the threat actor, but at the same time, you have to weigh up what your risk assessment is. And that's why I say with our intelligence, we don't try and encourage you to buy the products. I mean, there's a number of things that Mimecast do to counter this, but I'm not I'm not in the sales and obviously the Mimecast is sitting and thinking, Francis, please don't talk about our products because you have no idea. And I generally don't on purpose because I try and keep that file between me and sales that I, I don't understand the product and therefore I can't compromise myself. So that when I'm giving you intelligence and advice, it's as an intelligence uh, analyst rather than me trying to get you to buy my product. But there are a number of different, me uh, you know, products on the market it's based based on your risk uh, adversity whether you've got the, the money so there's lots of different things you as the decision maker will need to do and this particular one is a key one you know do you have the data resources to send the documents and the, the files or do you ask people to click on links <clears throat> we're saying their return to work messages shouldn't be forwarded duplicated this increased volume of emails emanating from various managers and you get different managers then repassing on what their senior managers said to them it's just again increasing the confusion but also the opportunity for a threat actor to you know add to that keep partners informed and obviously those of you who do deal with the contractors you know in the buildings but also at home or whatever keep in contact with your third parties keep talking to them because if they do disappear at least you know that and you're not going to be at risk for an impersonation attack administrators should review the accesses partners and supply chains have as a result because you know let's stop them all or let's do what you know what would be your policy your practice here and that, not to say they reapply but when this is not over but when we start our phase return do we get them to verify themselves again like we did when they first onboarded so that, you know how are your administrators going to deal with that another one and this is a spectacular one the administrators should also review your physical assets so i worked for an organization that just checked what our physical assets were and um in it we uh, had our particular company um had sold different buildings in time and things like that we found 2,000 assets that were in other buildings that were still linking into our network that actually just weren't part of our you know authority or ownership when we sold the building there was various bits and pieces of kit in various buildings and they actually were still connecting and some of them were up to seven years uh, out of date so it shows you and there was a brilliant attack in America where they went through a Windows XP um, system um, and they just didn't know they had that system still as an outlier uh, in the, the south of the country. And then consideration should begin, obviously, to just decommission assets that don't have unsupported systems. And this would be the Windows 7. I mean, you know, we see on our client base up to a third of the customers still have Windows 7 somewhere in their system. And that's a worry because it's not supported anymore. The vulnerabilities are known. So a nice example to show you that it's not all doom and gloom there is um, HMS Queen Elizabeth, the aircraft carrier. Um, the Royal Navy elected, not just the Royal Navy, but the government elected to have Windows XP as its navigation uh, system. And you think, oh my gosh, it's got known vulnerabilities. They accepted the risk because the navigation system doesn't connect to any of the other systems on board, the, the, the PMS, the program management systems. And also, we still have, you know, I-101 where someone looks out the window and actually still um, navigates on charts so therefore if, if it has been compromised it'll be easy to tell and also you can tell that you're supposed to be off the coast of the Isle of Wight not off the coast of China so there are these bit of giveaways when you look out the window of a, a ship especially a big one like that so into our final bits what keeps me awake at night and what are my concerns for this year well ransomware um, we're seeing so much of it it's uh, it, it's pain it's working so people are still clicking on links people are still allowing me to take over your systems and therefore the ransomware 5G, so our thought leadership Thursday talk in uh, July, uh, June is actually from Vodafone, just talking about the security policies around the 5G. But what is not not, not a worry about 5G in terms of whether it's, you know, Huawei and all that sort of rubbish, so I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is the 5G allows a, a bigger bandwidth. Now, traditionally, when I try and put malware down on your phone, because obviously that's a nice vulnerability, 
it's hard to obfuscate this code because your battery will start overheating. So you get a hot battery or your battery runs out. That tells you that something on your phone is not working properly. And it could be just the OS, but it also could be that malware has been deposited. And remember I was telling you about those pineapple attacks. Well, I can actually do those man in the middle attack, drop the malware on your phone. So you can use all the, um, I don't know, secure systems, WhatsApp, Signal, or whatever you think is encrypted. It doesn't matter you use encrypted. I'm sitting on your phone. I'm seeing what you're seeing. So the 5G allows a, a bigger attack because that bigger bandwidth, I can actually hide my code now and therefore it presents new attack um, opportunities. So it's just that one of 5G, just be aware that you, know, you may protect your laptops, your network at home, your network, but actually you should start giving consideration to having some sort of protection on your, on your mobile devices. Sophisticated um, spear phishing and whaling, we are seeing that, and I've talked about the pattern of live analysis, that's increasing because it pays. I do a week's worth of work, I get a good attack, I get my return. It was easy. Um, yes, I can send out thousands of emails and you know, statistically 3% will click on them. So I'll get that. But this is actually a, a nicer one where I can go after a particular target. <clears throat> Remote working was always a concern for me. And obviously this was before COVID because people were bringing their own devices you know, and bringing with it all the various things that they've been clicking on. Uh, my father at home, he just clicks on anything he likes. And you, I mean, I, I just desperately, I block everything my dad sends to me because you know, he, he thinks he's uh, cyber aware, but you're thinking, and he wonders why he has all these pop-ups appearing on his screen and thinking, Dad, why did you click on that? So that remote working, bring your own devices, some of them carry their own vulnerabilities. I've talked about shadow IT, legacy systems, mergers and acquisitions. So we've already talked about that. The internet um, based attacks. So this is where your firmware, your smart TVs, your smart watches. These are ways where you may not realize, but all the time your smart watch is trying to connect to things. It's always attempting a three way handshake. So I walk into McDonald's, it's attempting to talk to the Wi Fi. It won't connect because you haven't given it permission to, but it's still doing that attempt. And there's me listening, watching to see what devices are around me. Increasing attempts to capture that data in transit. And you know, the, the new NHS app is a, a lovely one at the moment for me. Threat actors will continue to exploit ML AI systems. And we're talking about that sandbox evasion I've already talked about for you. And um, we expect to see an increase in automation and countering um, attacks. So identifying the vulnerabilities and then therefore the threat actors will then try and move on. So it's always a, a cat and mouse battle. So, but we will start seeing more automated ways of countering attacks. Homer growth hieroglyph, these are ones I talked about, you know, with that small accent above a letter or, or um, R and N, Romeo and November, so close together, it gives it as a mic. So instead of saying dot com, it's dot corn, but you don't see that. And that could be another way of me sending you to a, a site that I want you to. Malware as a service, so Emotet, we suspect, has actually started to be sold. So the Emotet um, coders have uh, decided to start um, offering that as a service and therefore increasing their revenue but also decreasing their chance of detection because they're no longer doing the attacks themselves that's not necessarily true i'm just using emeter as an example not as um, we've seen that <clears throat> and then the attacks via third party supply chain will continue to increase and impact and i've said it again being obfuscated by the return to work and by the covid our supply chains uh, are making us more vulnerable so we need to keep verifying who they are obviously with all of that going on and remember that stemples Part of that was legal. With all these cyber domain concerns, will we get our legislation changed? If we can't be trusted with people's data, and we've seen so many data breaches, legislation then comes in to make us. And this will actually be harder to operate because it makes it harder for customers. So now we've got multi-factor authentication. These inconvenience customers, and therefore they try and do workarounds. So we try to avoid legislation where we can because it can be prohibitive in our working. And that was a nice example of GDPR and various others because Again, uh, we didn't look after people's data, so governments around the world legislated that we would have to. I've talked about the sophisticated impersonation attacks, just gave you one example of how I would do it on Facebook or social media, and then an increased usage of fireless techniques. Um, so this was years and years ago that, that we saw this one, and then there was a reporting earlier this year that there was uh, you know, evidence of one, but it, it turned out to be not. But this is one where they're looking at, we're seeing, you know, when I talked about that trebuchet in the forest, mm -hmm. we're actually starting to see more and more people investigating opportunities of having fireless techniques, because obviously it helps me get around various uh, defences. I have done what Chloe told me to do. I've left 10 minutes for questions if you have any, or um, just leave you with don't have nightmares. 
Yeah, I was going to say thank you for that, um, Francis. Um, yeah, so if anyone does have any questions, please feel free to use the chat functionality that you'll be able to see in Teams. Um, you do that by clicking on the speech bubble on the toolbar when you move your mouse. Um, if you don't have that functionality, some of you might not be able to see it if you've joined Teams through the web browser. Um, please feel free to just unmute yourselves and ask a question regardless. I think, Francis, thank you so much. You've given us a lot of things to take away and think about, and I've learned a lot as part of this, so thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name's Simon Skelton. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, yep. Good morning. Thank you for the talk. Um, a quick question, please. Uh, we subscribe to Mimecast via Cobweb. Does that protect us for everything you discussed? Um, it, it will protect you from what... Uh, um, this is where I'm trying to be careful with sales because I don't know the product. Sorry. It, it depends on what products you have. So um, I've talked about so many different things. So um, I know we have a product that... Um, does internal protects you know so where you're emailing internally the company so you're not going through the castle wall for one of a better way you know that inner keep uh, analogy so we have that product so if you um, have that that protects you from once something's in your system to stop it propagating inside um, so this uh, unfortunately i can't Francis, let me jump in there go on then, um, because i can't <laughs> uh, thank sorry, you Francis. I, I was trying to help you a little while ago and then i was talking on mute um sorry um, Simon, hi, my name's David. I'm the partner account manager, so I look after Mimecast relationship with Cobweb. Um, so it, it may well be me that you spoke to when you, when you came on board as a customer. Um, I think the best thing to do is, as Francis mentioned, we've got lots of different products that cover lots of different services. Um, a great deal of the really important things that we do, you certainly will be covered by, and you know, certainly that phishing protection. But um, you know, rather than potentially miss surprise on this call, let's set up a call um, after this session, have a look at what products and services you take with us, how they're configured, uh, and then go from there with any advice that we might want to offer. That's great. Yes, please. Thank you, David. Well, thank you, Francis. Right. Uh, but just to help you there, if I can just reply as an intelligence analyst, when I actually have to do customer, not visits, but customer calls because things have happened, 80% and it is that number because we've we did the stats we collected all the details 80% of them is because their system wasn't configured correctly it's just that when they, they were setting themselves up they didn't click on the the various check boxes so one of the first things before I start doing an intelligence analysis I go look at the configuration because that could just save me a whole lot of work if I can just configure the system properly so just uh, that could be a nice little first stop as well just making sure you are configured <laughs> David, thank you David will go for all of that with you yeah, and I was going to say, and following on from that, we are doing a sort of a special offer for all of our customers that have joined today. And, you know, that kind of highlights their security concerns. So we'll be sending more information about that either later today or tomorrow morning once the security day is over. But if anyone has any more questions, I realize we've got a few minutes left before the end of the webinar. So be sure to ask them now. And just so you know, we have recorded this, so we will be sending out the recording later today as well. That's why I didn't go into too much detail. Yes. <laughs> that, did, that did make me laugh when you said that you didn't want to give anyone any ideas. <laughs> I think if, if no one's got any more questions, I think we will leave it there then, Francis. So once again, thank you so much for joining us today. And Francis, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us this morning. Yeah. Everyone else, enjoy no the rest of your day. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thanks all. Bye-bye.